first of all, Jennifer, before we do anything, can you take me through, well, basically, I know it's not a basic story, but basically through your story and why you're in the public eye and say it in, in your words, because the last thing I want to do is put words in your mouth. So I think that's a good starting point. Let's let's start with that. How, what what do you remember about this whole crime that happened, atrocity that happened to you 27 years ago? Well, I, I remember everything. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to ever just give an overview, um, but I can try to cut it down a little bit. Um, so I was raised by a single mother. And, um, my dad was always, um, they were never married and he was always in and out of jail. And, um, my mom worked two jobs at a time uh, to support us. And we had a two bedroom apartment in Dickinson, Texas, which is the town that I grew up in. And we had been living in that apartment complex for about five years, um, before the attack happened. My grandfather was very involved in the community of Dickinson. My grandparents lived there as well, my mom's parents. And um, he noticed, you know, the crime rate kind of growing up a little bit. And he offered to, um, he purchased a foreclosed home and fixed it up for us to move into. So we were actually preparing to move out of our apartment and into our first home. And we had been doing yard work um, over at our house, which is, just about a mile down the road from where our apartment complex uh, was located. So the evening before the attack, uh, my mom and I had been out in the yard here in Texas um, in August. It's really hot and humid out, very muggy weather um, in the end of summer months. And we have a lot of mosquitoes here. Um, So that was the weather back then. And we were out and we had been out in the yard raking leaves and I got, a ton of mosquito bites. We um, finished up our yard work and went back to our apartment to, um, you know, do our usual bedtime routine, which was, you know, take our showers or baths and get ready for bed. And when I was little, I was always terrified of the dark. I don't know why. I just was. And it was just always me and my mom. So even though I had a bedroom of my own, I always preferred to just sleep in bed with her. So uh, I went to bed with my mother, and in the middle of the night, I was um, itching those mosquito bites that I had gotten on my leg. And she woke me up and said, you know, you're keeping me up. I have to work in the morning. Could you please just go sleep in your own bed tonight? And I said, just because I love you, Mom, I'm going to go sleep in my own room. So I remember, um, you know, getting off the bed and kind of being hesitant at her doorway and then going into my room and I had this lamp, this big lamp that was shaped like a light bulb. And I turned that on and I got out my piggy bank and some books and fell asleep. The next thing I remember is waking up in the arms of this man that I didn't know. He had kidnapped me through my bedroom window and he was walking, I mean not walking, running. He was running with me down the sidewalk um, of our, outside of our apartment complex. And he had his hands over my mouth, so I couldn't scream. And when I was eight years old, I was really tiny. I only weighed like 45 pounds. I was just a very thin little girl. Um, so it's not like I could kind of fight him or anything like that. Plus, I was, you know, waking up to all this happening. So I didn't know what was going on. And I just remember looking back and seeing my mom's car parked in her parking space. And he put me in his vehicle, sat me on his lap, and drove off with me. Um, and it was, we're estimating about 2 or 3 a.m., so it was, you know, dark outside. He, instead of getting on the freeway and getting out of town, he actually just stayed on this main road that goes through Dickinson from one end of town to the other. It's called Deets Road, and that's also the road that my grandparents lived off of. And um, he passed their home, and all their vehicles were there, and I said, Um, he told me he was an undercover police officer and for me to calm down and that everything was going to be okay. And, um, I said, well, my grandparents are home. You can take me there. And he said, nobody's home. And he kept on driving and he drove to my elementary school and, um, pulled in there. He said, we were going to wait on my mom to pick me up. And then soon after that, he said she wasn't coming and he started up his vehicle and took me to a vacant 
field just a couple miles um, from where he originally kidnapped me out of the apartment, and but it was on the other side of town. So it was, I would say, between three and four miles from our uh, apartment complex. And there he uh, took me out of the car. He raped me. He slit my throat from ear to ear. And he left me in the field to die um, after he put my head in a fire ant pile. And um, he told me all kinds of things um, during the car ride. And um, when we parked, you know, at the field, he just would tell me different things about being an undercover cop and me calming down and um, that it was all going to be all right. And then he would switch and tell me that we were hiding from bad people. And um, it was just like he would go back and forth of kind of feeling guilty and then not feeling guilty and kind of wanting to have his way. Um, I woke up to children, hearing children playing, and I could also see cars driving by. Um, he left me in an overgrown field, so no one could see me from the roadway, but I could kind of, through the brush, um, see cars and hear people, and um, I could hear dogs barking, and uh, I would try to stand up and couldn't figure out why I couldn't, and I didn't realize that my throat had been slit uh, from ear to ear. So I, uh, I eventually was found by children playing tag, in uh, the field, one of them tripped over my foot and came across my body. And um, then I was life flighted uh, and taken to John Seeley Hospital on Galveston Island. And there I was treated for a lacerated throat and trachea and I stayed in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, and I was told that I would never be able to speak again. But I started speaking before I left the hospital to return back to school for the third grade. So that's just kind of an overview of the attack itself. Um, of course, my attacker um, was not found for 19 years. And um, before, you know, advances in DNA happened and um, my case had been taken over several different times over the course of the 19 years, um, we kind of really had to rely on DNA evidence to um, play a big part in his arrest. Um, which was in 2009, and then he took his own life in 2010, um, just as we were getting ready to go, uh, prepare to go to court for trial. And I, I, that's an incredible story. You don't hear that, and the fact that you remember it detail for detail. I, I saw your story on uh, FBI criminal pursuit, Criminal Pursuits on Netflix here in Australia, and I started doing some reading and watching different short clips about you online as well, and it, like, there's a lot of information about you online, but you still remember it detail for detail. Have you talked to other people that have had similar experience? Is it common to remember it all detail for detail, or is that just something you you can do? No, it's really... Um, most children that go through a traumatic event like that, their brain just really works hard to kind of block out a lot of the trauma. Um, I just, I don't know, I don't know why I'm different, um, but from doing speaking engagements and things, it definitely seems like I'm not the norm. Um, I just know that um, when it happened, my favorite nurse, Sharon McBride, really played a big part in me um, starting to speak and give details, um, even before I could actually physically have my voice back, she uh, came to my bedside and said that she, you know, for me to not be afraid and that she had a daughter named Jessica who was my same age. And um, that's all she had to say. Once she said that to me, it was like I was determined to um, just really remember every detail and started writing down notes um, just days after the attack, medicated, and in the pediatric intensive care unit um, and, uh, you know, having had surgery on my throat and all these things, I just really still wanted to try to remember every detail and I started writing down all of those details, um, you know, to provide any information I could to the police because in my eight-year-old mind, I thought, well, I don't want him to go and hurt Jessica. I didn't want anyone to have to go through what I had just been through. 
So if I could prevent that in any way, I wanted to help in doing so. So um, I I wrote the notes, and um, I would write them and hand them to my mother, who would then hand them to a um, police officer who would be waiting outside of um, the bedroom, I mean the bedroom, the hospital room door. Uh, we had security around the clock because this is the first major thing that happened in the area that I live in here in Galveston County. Um, and so everybody was just on high alert. And being that this uh, person also said that he was an undercover police officer, it really had people on edge. We didn't know, if, you know, to believe that or not. So, um, of course, you hope that a, a police officer wouldn't say such a thing and do such a thing, but you just never know. So, um I just have always really been determined to remember all the details of my uh, my attack and hoping that one day that information would result in his arrest. Outside of your mum, the doctors, nurses and the police, do you remember the first time you felt comfortable sharing your story? Because it's not exactly something you'd open with when you're jumping into the third grade. It's It's kind of intense some kids might not understand it obviously you had that scar on your neck um is that something you got questions about through primary school oh yeah I remember going through elementary school and um here we would have we have all these tables in a big you know lunch room and the lunch line would go right through the center of where all the tables were um, positioned and the kids would all um not in a making fun type of way, but just in a curious type of way, you know, ask like, what happened? Or I saw you on the news or what's that tube in your throat because I had a trach um, or, or did they catch the bad man yet? And people would constantly question me. Um, and then I couldn't participate like in our physical education, our PE classes. I wasn't able to participate because of the trach in my throat. So I would have to go and sit in the nurse's office for that 30 minutes um, a day and, um, I just, I I don't remember the very first time, but um, people will tell me, like, do you remember when, you know, we were hiding under a table at church um, camp and you shared your story with me? Or do you remember when we were sitting in the hallway at school and, you know, you told me some things about your attack? I always found little ways to kind of just openly share, um, always thinking that if I shared my, the more I shared my story, um, you know, someone may know some, someone who had heard something about this person and it may lead to his arrest. So um, I know as I got older, I very much shared, um, you know, openly, um, especially like in high school. And I started to kind of just grow into myself and really want to become involved in um, helping in the solving of my case because it was frustrating to constantly have the case handed off from investigator to investigator. And I wanted to be um, a big part of the solving of, of my case, you know, as much as legally possible without jeopardizing it if we were ever going to go to court. So um, it was just really about time being on our side um, with the d- advances in DNA and also finding an investigator who uh, really would allow me to uh, have input and be involved um, in the solving of my own case. So when Detective Cromie took it over in 2008, um, I just really, we felt this connection, and he told me that he and Agent Richard Renison with the FBI would do um, whatever they could to get me the answers that they knew that I, I wanted and deserved. So, um, you know, it really made me feel like I was a part of a team and that it was going to be a team effort, and um, 18 months later, my case was solved. <laughs> it still gives me shivers, um, mm-hmm. and you've, you've probably heard that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times as well. As a 9, 10, 11-year-old through primary school, were you more worried about the attack reoccurring, or were you worried about having to explain the scar to your, your fellow classmates? And school kids. No, I was a never. The scar actually, I, for the first year, it was very red and noticeable. After that, I mean, you can't even tell it's really on my neck. Um, that scar where he cut me, or the trach scar, they both healed really, really well. It was more so. Um, I was. I always feared. Um, the biggest fear is the unknown. 
And when you don't know who did something like that to you and your, you know, years keep passing and there's no answer, there's nobody on the radar, it really becomes terrifying. And you always wonder if they're going to come back and finish you off, you know. And that's what always really played through my mind was, um, you know, is he going to come back and um, finish me off, hurt me, hurt my mother, break into our home again, I mean, and when you just don't know who's done something like this, and like I said, you know, the years and months keep pa- the months and years keep passing, and uh, that's always in the back of your mind. And then also you start to question yourself because four days after the attack, I worked with a forensic sketch artist in my hospital um, bed who um, came up with a drawing with me. Um, of the attacker and then his vehicle then as the years passes you start to doubt yourself you know and you wonder well is that really what he looked like I mean I'm positive that's what he looked like but you know could I be wrong it was three o'clock in the morning it was pitch black outside um some people would say that my sketch looked his like he was more Hispanic and I was positive that he was Caucasian and um you just really start to you know doubt certain things um and in the end, the sketch was spot on, even the sketch of his car. So uh, it's really, really um, surreal how all that worked out. Um, but no, I would definitely say that I was always more concerned with him coming back or, you know, um, when we would just be out running simple errands like, you know, trip to the grocery store or the post office, you often wonder, like, you know, could that be him? few years have passed, you know, he's aged a little bit, um, but just living kind of with that fear of him coming back for you is um, definitely what I would say played through my mind the most. What were your teenage years like? Yeah, like you said, you were more worried about him coming back to finish you off. Did that carry over into your teenage years? Were you someone that went to parties, that hung out with friends, or were you more of a nervous teenager? In junior high, um, I would say I was more nervous. I definitely um, didn't uh, really like to go to like slumber parties and stuff. I like to just have people over at my house, and I was just more cautious. In high school, I kind of you know, grew my wings a little bit. I had my own vehicle at 16. I had a job. I um, started taking college classes early on. Um, You know, during the summers, I would always want to get ahead. And so I would take high school classes at the college during the summer months, during my high school years to get ahead. And um, I don't really remember being scared. Um, No, I didn't really like to stay at home alone for the longest time. Um, so I'd often like go to my grandmother's house or something like that. But then in high school, I, uh, like I said, I, I grew my wings and just kind of found myself and, you know, became more independent. I did, you know, go to parties and hang out with friends and have that whole high school experience that you have, um, on weekends. And I would go to football games and, um, you know, do all those usual things. I don't feel like the attack really held me back in that aspect, um, you know, as I got older and actually the day after I graduated high school, I moved out of state um, to Iowa and um, had two jobs and had my own apartment and um, moved back home six months later because it was too cold there. <laughs> but uh, I started taking college classes once I got back home and, again, had a job, had my own apartment, had a boyfriend, and, you know, um, I just feel like, you know, I grew into myself, so I've never really let it hold me back as far as, you know, me being afraid. Do you remember things like your first mobile phone or sleeping in a friend's house or the first time going out with friends? Are you someone that can remember those milestones because they may have been more of an achievement for you than they were for other kids? Mm, No, I don't really remember, like, I don't remember my first sleepover or anything like that. It was probably at my friend Jessica's house. We were best friends, and she lived just uh, two doors down from our house. So (laughs) it was probably with her, um, you know, where I felt, um, like, comfort. 
and uh, wouldn't be too far away from home. Are you still good friends with her today? Yes. Yep. Oh, yeah. Keeping my, my friendships are um, pretty much all lifelong. Um, I went to school in Dickinson from kindergarten through um, high school, so I grew up in the same town and went to you know all the same schools, had the same friends pretty much. Uh, my whole life, we all went to church together and um, attended school together. So a lot of the friendships that I, I have are from um, daycare days and, you know, early school days. So I really cherish those. And um, even though we're all grown and have our own families and stuff, we still try to, you know, keep in touch with each other um, and at least talk from time to time throughout the year and, you know, just check up on each other and see how each other's doing if we're unable to get together because of kids or jobs or <laughs> whatever. And you you mentioned earlier on as, as well you started helping out with the investigation. When did you start helping out with the investigation and how old were you? I would say it was probably more, uh, probably my junior and senior year of high school. I started really um, questioning like the police work, I wanted to know what what was going on, what had been done, what hadn't been done, what could be done. Um, I started thinking of things like, well, you know, why couldn't we reach out to John Walsh with America's Most Wanted and have my case featured? Why can't we call Oprah? Oprah can help everybody. <laughs> and let's, you know, go on Oprah and reach out to these people. And, of course, being a little police department, um, you know, some of those ideas um, with the investigator that had it at the time um, is a bit hesitant, you know. Um, I think they're a little they're a little scared at the time, and wanted me to kind of have my place in the back seat and not um, in the forefront. But it just uh, really took um, me insisting and pushing um, and being a part of it, and then Detective Comey taking my case over and him really seeing my passion and my drive and um, that I wanted this solved, um, not only for myself, but, you know, because of other others. I was terrified all those years that would pass that he would be hurting so many other people, and I didn't want that. So, um, you know, I was just always thinking about how many others there would be, and, um, you know, I wanted to be able to prevent him from hurting anyone else so every year that would pass, it would just get a little bit more um, drive in me to, you know, push a little bit harder and trying to have uh, the police department uh, listen, <laughs> listen to me and um, really let me help out. I'm the only, you know, witness and I'm living and I remember all the details. And so uh, with my notes coupled with that, you know, from right after the attack and the sketch and the sketch of the car, um, I think it's just really um, kind of some egos got in the way. You know, everybody wants to be the hero, and um, it's hard to let, uh, you know, um, I hate saying the word victim, but um, it's hard to sometimes let a victim be involved um, for fear of jeopardizing the case if you ever make it to trial. But, you know, no trial was even in sight. We didn't even have a suspect, so... That's what I was trying to get um, them to understand is that I just wanted to be able to help in giving details so that we could hopefully, you know, um, somehow come across a suspect and go to trial someday. So you got to start from the bottom and kind of work your way up. And um, it was really a blessing to cross paths with Detective Cromie and have him um, and Special Agent Richard Renison brought on uh to help with my case because they really allowed me to be a part of that team. And I I heard that you did a 15-week course through the police academy after your case was closed. What did that involve? Oh, it was the Citizens Police Academy where I live. Um, I live just two exits away from Dickinson. I live in League City, Texas. And um, my husband and I have had our home for... 12 years now, um, 13 years, 13 years now. And um, so just the local police department, they have done over 20 
um, classes where they have um, citizens can register and see what it's like, uh, what the police officers go through. And each week is kind of a different uh, theme, the nightly class that you take. And uh, it's a different theme. Like one week you learn all about the SWAT team and what all that entails, or you learn about um, different calls that they go through and what kind of education you have to have to go through the police, the actual police academy. And they even let you do ride-alongs with the police officers Um you know, and go with them while they're answering calls and whatnot and kind of just live your life um, in the day of a police officer. And so I really enjoyed that. And um, actually, at the time that I was in it, America's Most Wanted reached out. This is before my case was solved and wanted to feature my story on their show. And so they got to come and film me in class um, on a night that we were learning about SWAT and tactical things. So that was pretty fun. Since you were since the attack in 1919, an, an incredible thing, well, the whole world has developed incredibly, some in some ways positively, in some ways negatively. But an amazing thing called the internet has become the world's most used virtual tool. How do you feel ab- uh, about your story being recounted so many times by so many different sources, using all different adjectives from all different angles? Is it a surreal experience or is it more confronting for you? Um, I find myself really becoming frustrated um, with all the different media outlets. I love for people to reach out to me and for me to be able to tell my story and give the facts. I don't like when I come across stories that where no one's ever reached out to me and this whole article has been written without even speaking to me and they give all these details that came from I don't know where. <laughs> Um, I'm just so passionate about my story being told the right way and for people to have um, the right information and, um, you know, not make it more than what it is um, because to me it's already such a big story in itself um, with so many details. You know, I find myself getting frustrated when people want to add more onto it um, and, like I said, just make it make it something that it's not. Um, but I love that the Internet... Um, is able to help aid in sharing my story. Um, It's helped a lot of people. I save every email that I get um, where people are um, giving me feedback or um, sharing their own stories. I love to print them out and um, keep them so that one day my children can read through those emails and see how um, just by doing something that I felt was right, which is using my voice to share my story, it's allowed so many other people to open up and share their stories as well. Um, I want my children to learn, um, if they learn anything from this, I want them to always um, stand up for what they believe in, um, even if they don't have the support of, um, of others. I have several family members who, um, you know, have kind of just wanted to move on in life, understandably so, but that haven't been very supportive of, um, of me and my endeavors. And I've just never let that get in the way of me sharing my story. I share my story because I believe that's my purpose in life. Um, I wasn't ever supposed to be able to talk again. And so I believe that God gave me my voice back for a reason. And I believe that reason is to share my story and helping other people. So um, if I can be a voice for others, I... You know, love that. I I think it's a blessing, and um, you know, I want that to be a lesson that I'm able to share with my children. Um, even if you know people don't support you and you feel something is right, then you stand up for what you believe in and you just fight through it and continue to do it because you can help other people um, in doing so. So um, I am very appreciative, um, you know, for the internet and that it's able to. It's been able to, you know, help in sharing my story worldwide. I've gotten emails from so many um, countries and um, just all over the world. Um, People have seen, you know, media outlets like, you know, from television, newspapers, um, websites where they've seen my story. And I've traveled all over the United States and been up to Canada um, and sharing my story at uh, conferences, mainly focusing on law enforcement, but also... Um, victims' rights and um, every profession that works with um, crimes against children or um, victims. So doctors, nurses, 
um, attorneys, judges, um, you know, police officers, detectives, FBI agents. Um, I've been invited to present at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., and have my um, story broadcasted all over the world at every embassy, and that was an amazing opportunity. I um, have spoken at the world's largest conference for crimes against children, which was held in Dallas, Texas, and I was eight months pregnant with my daughter, Jenna, and got to be the keynote speaker um, for about 3,000 people. And so I really love to share my story because... um, you know, afterward, you get to hear feedback from the audience and hearing a detective say, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm getting burnt out, but now hearing your story um, and seeing your drive has given me drive to go back to my desk and look at these cases with fresh eyes and, you know, it just really lit a fire inside of me to um, work these cases a little bit harder and get these answers because I can see from your perspective as the victim and the survivor of this case that, you know, you needed that detective to work with you. And, um, you know, I see the kind of relationship I need to have. And then I've been to conferences um, where the entire conference is for crime victims and their families. And so you get to hear from other people who are like you and have gone through similar experiences or their family members who have lost a loved one due to crime and they want to know how they can help in solving their family members that they lost um, their case and, you know, they ask you questions and just to be able to be that little bit of light for someone else and give them that hope that they'll get answers someday um, really is a blessing to me. Have you ever been contacted for an interview from uh, from someone in Australia, apart from me? Um, For magazines. Okay. (laughs) All right, yeah, no, 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 that's that's good. I like I like being a first first Australian radio presenter, so that's that's kind of yeah. cool. But I haven't I actually haven't done. I don't think that I. I think I might have done maybe two other radio interviews. Ah. Other than that, I haven't really done a lot of radio. So okay, cool. Well, yeah. y- your description and your answers are amazing for radio. You've really got a lot of detail, which is good, which is what I want. Do you, the 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 other thing that I want to ask about the internet is something it it doesn't it's kind of like a a a joke almost when kids do it at schools and stuff. But do you remember the first time you Googled yourself? Oh yeah, I was like, gosh, it was probably because the the internet came out what ten years, if that maybe eight years after. Yeah the attack happened to you and all of a sudden yeah, all this content go- has been uploaded. Google. Yeah, but I didn't even think about Googling myself until I was like, my case is already solved and all that. And I think someone was like, oh, you should Google yourself. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then you Google yourself and you see tons of images and you know newspaper articles and um, TV shows and all kinds of things that you've done. It's really neat because it just kind of keeps it um, like in a timeline for you, um, but I'm kind of a pack rat myself, so I like to keep every newspaper article. And um, you know, I'm I still have evidence. Like when my case was closed down, I got a box of um, all the evidence for my case, and I just like to keep all of those things, um, you know, just in case, and so that I have them all um, in case I ever decide to write a book or something. <laughs> I uh, I've got all my materials that I need, but um, yeah, Googling yourself, that's really something, I mean, it's its fascinating how, um, you know, it's just all there. Did you <laughs> find... On the internet with the click of a button. Did you find an article or an interview or some, or someone recounting a story that you didn't yeah. know about? Um, I, well, kind of. I mean, just because I, I have, um, my mom kept all the newspaper articles from when I was in the hospital back in 1990, but now... You know, of course, all of that is archived and been uploaded on the Internet. So, um, you know, seeing all that stuff for the first, I mean, I have the hard copies of it, but seeing it, like, just being able to access it right there on the Internet was, you know, really pretty neat. And in terms of being on shows like America's Most Wanted or FBI Criminal Pursuits, is there a difference for you between narrating your own story and having someone else narrate it for you? Do you still have a 
a saying if someone else is narr- is being the narrator instead of you? Oh yeah, I definitely every TV show that I do, I'm uh, trying to be very involved. I let the producers know from the get go that you know I only want the facts given, and I ask them to please fact check with me if they have any questions. And I've done several shows for the ID channel. Um, I most recently did a one hour special with 48 hours here um, in the United States. And um, I've done shows like I Survived, um, Who the Bleep Did I Marry with um, my attacker's first wife. I mean, just all kinds of different shows. And every time I um, I want to make sure that that's correct. I will say that I do not like reenactments. <laughs> I, I just don't like them. I feel like they're never, you know, spot on and they're so dramatic and... I, I just don't like reenactments. But other than that, I mean, I've had a pretty good run with, um, you know, everyone that I've met in television has been really nice and on board uh, with, you know, making it as uh, factual as possible, which I have always appreciated. And that's I've always been really yeah. respectful of that. So. And that's kind of the hard thing. When your story has been recounted so many times by so many different sources, all right. those ad- adjectives ad- sometimes trying to encourage, I guess, pity. I think there's a difference between empathy right. and, and straight-out like pity. That. Oh, man. Yeah. Right. And I, oh, I, that's one thing I've never wanted for myself and just have never really put up with. I never allowed myself to become angry over what happened to me Um I never pitied myself or, um, you know, wanted to be holed up at home, you know. Um, I just, I mean, as a child, I feel like I had a normal, a pretty normal childhood before and after the attack, um, even though my dad wasn't involved. I mean, my mom kept me involved in sports and piano lessons and church and, um, you know, being in the um, the girls' club at the church and making sure I would go on Wednesday, Wednesdays and Sundays and, um our church is actually on the same street as our apartment complex that I was kidnapped out of. So I went to that church before the attack and after the attack. So we would pass by that apartment, you know, several times. I mean, every, every day, pretty much going to our new home and to my grandparents' house and to church. Uh, it was right there off the freeway. So we would pass by there all the time. And, um, you know, I just didn't really let it affect me. Um, I just kind of always, knew that I wanted answers and that I would want to help in searching for those answers and just hoped for the best outcome, um, no matter how long it took. So, um, you know, a lot of people say they feel sorry for me because it took so long, but really, um, I try to look at it in a positive way. And like I've mentioned several times, um, you know, time was actually really on our side, um, because of the advances in DNA really, I mean, it came back with one match, you know, can't go wrong with, uh, DNA match. So, I mean, it's him. We got a great confession out of him over a course of three and a half hours. I say we, but really Detective Cromie and Agent Renison. And then he, you know, confessed other times as well after uh, he was already in jail, like to the guards and things like that, kind of in a bragging way. Um, You know, but I, uh, there was, I just, I never really let it Uh, get to me in a negative way because I just always felt like, you know, being angry about what happened wouldn't get me anywhere. So just really try to make a positive out of a negative and traumatic experience. So if there are new articles coming out about you, do you try and proofread them before they go out to maybe try and alter the adjectives that they've used? Because that's that's what Uh, the media is. They they need they need a sub story to kind of sell it. But if you're not into that you've Yeah. Yeah. I mean if if they reach out to me, I mean, I I someone sent me a link on Facebook the other day, some website I've never heard of, of some article was written about me. It was totally wrong. It said my mom and dad lived together and had all these crazy things in it that never happened. And you know, I wrote the people and never heard anything back. But you know, just said that I don't understand how they could even write an article when they've never reached out to me or spoken with me. And then they publish it on the internet you know, where it is forever, <laughs> and it's not even correct. So that's kind of aggravating, um, you know, just because I don't want to ever have any misleading information about my case out there. I mean, I have been living with this uh, for 27 years, and, um, you know, like I said earlier, it's 
enough. It's enough of a story in itself. We don't need extra drama <laughs> added to it or misinformation. Um, I, I want people to have the facts. So, yes, if someone reaches out to me and wants to write an article, I always ask that I'm able to proofread it first to make sure or that they please fact check with me instead of just relying on, you know, whatever they come across um, on the Internet to write their article. And you've mentioned that you, you have, have two kids. They're only young. Um, one, I think one is on the verge of starting school soon. Do you ever think about how and when you will pass on the messages to your kids that you learned 27 years ago? Is that something that you need to think about now or is that something you may leave no. for another five years or whatever? No, my daughter, uh, my daughter is five and she, um, she just turned five and she has been, um, she has been in, pre- she went to pre-K three last year. She's in pre-K four this year. And, and, um, when she was about two years old, she tried to walk off from me in the grocery store and it really just, I mean, panicked. I mean, a complete panic attack. It gave me such awful anxiety um that I left my grocery cart and everything and I went in the car with her and I um told her that when I was little um you know a bad man took mommy and hurt me very very bad and that she could never walk off for me in a store and I've always just kind of been without giving her any gory details of course it was really I mean to me honesty is the best policy and um giving her age appropriate information and explanations is what I've always done. I've been honest with her um, that something, you know, bad happened to me as a child. She's come along to speaking engagements when she was way younger. Um, when she got to the age where she could kind of start remembering things, uh, of course, you know, my husband would come and they would go sightseeing wherever we were at and not sit in on the presentation. I uh, wouldn't want her to have any of that kind of information at her young age. I don't want her to be afraid or, you know, let what happened to me hold her back in life at all. But, um, I will say she's a cautious little girl. Um, She's never run off from me since and um, never would. Um, So I I give her very little information, but enough to let her, she knows that something happened to me. Um, She's becoming more and more curious. And I just always tell her that, you know, when she's old enough, I'll explain uh, more of the details. Um, she's asked to see a picture of him before I've shown her a picture, but she doesn't know. Um, you know, she's never asked about the scar on my neck or to go into any details, uh, like that. So I would never tell her that he took me on my bedroom window or anything like that right now. Of course, she's already, she's like I was, um, she's scared of the dark and scared to sleep in her own room. So, uh, I don't want to put any more fear, you know, in her right now. Do you have My son a, is one, and he could care less about what's going on. <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> He's all boy, and he just climbs the walls and you know does boy stuff. So, do you have a set age where you think it will be appropriate, or is that just based on a maturity yeah. thing? Are you fearful yeah, of leaving it too I mean, late? My daughter, my daughter is um, very intelligent and very wise beyond her years uh, for being you know five years old. And so, I mean, I would, I would think maybe between 10 and 13, um, but really, yeah, it's just something that will come when it's supposed to based on her maturity level and being able to handle the information in an appropriate, um, and healthy way. I, like I said, I don't ever want to instill a fear in her, um, from what happened to me. And I want my fears of something happening to her to rub off on her. You know, I think every mom of course would fear any parent, um, you know, fear is something ever happening to their child, but I don't want that to hold her back in life from her having fun or, you know, being with her friends or um, any of that. So it's just going to be based on um, how she can handle and process uh, the information, and that'll just come, you know, in time. You've taken your story all over America, as you've mentioned, and up to Canada and um, you've done interviews, as you've mentioned, all around the world. What do you talk about in in the talks that you give to all these organizations? And what, do, what are your main messages? I've read that you can do presentations that go for anywhere between 30 minutes and three hours. Right. So our main um, presentation is um, with myself, Detective Cromie, and Agent Renison. A lot of times because of the FBI and all the different cases that um, the agents work, 
Agent Renison isn't available. So Detective Cromie and myself, you know, more often than not, we'll travel by ourselves um, and do the presentation together. It's about three to three and a half hours long, and it's a PowerPoint presentation. And we give the, my pre, uh, my perspective as a survivor um, of the case, and then he gives his perspective as a detective taking on a cold case that had been handed off several times and all the obstacles that he came across. I talk about all the obstacles I came across and my feelings and what I had to deal with and my thoughts. And, um, you know, we kind of uh, can um, adjust the presentation to our audience. So if someone contacts me and says, you know, we only have an hour time slot and I want to focus on victims' rights and things like that, then that's what I'll do. And we kind of just tweak it and make adjustments. Um, If it's, you know, a presentation where it needs to focus more on the FBI side or uh, more on it being a cold case, and we try to do that and kind of just accommodate um, to whoever is needing this presentation. And um, I've slowed down a little bit since I've become a mom, especially with having two kids. It's harder to travel and get away to do those things out of state. But um, as time allows, I do, and I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, every opportunity to me is a blessing in sharing my story. So um, as long as I am able, I uh, try to make myself available and uh, continue to to share. I love to go and do the in-person presentations and, uh, you know, be there with the audience and be able to answer the questions. Do you ever think about doing talks in different countries like Australia? Oh, sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, I love, I'm actually, um, I'm actually Canadian. I was born in Canada and so being able to, I hadn't been back there since, um, well, I was born there and then we came to the States and then I had gone back one time as a teenager to visit. So being able to go up to Canada and present, was really neat for me. Um, and then I, uh, of course, you know, I'm always open to going to other countries. Um, and actually was contacted one time um, by an organization in Africa wanting me to be a part of a tour that they were doing on sexual assault. And I really would have jumped on it, but we were um, uh, doing in, going through the whole in vitro process at the time, um, trying to have babies. So, uh, you know, I wasn't able to participate in that at the time. But of course, I'm always open to traveling and um, seeing different parts of the world and sharing my story and my message, um, you know, with others. How do you feel about the scar on your neck? Is it something you can be proud of? Or is it um, a reminder of your responsibility? Because it's, it's something that you can't cover up. Uh, it's in a spot no, that you can't obviously cover can't it cover it up. Like, it's not on your head or anything. How do right. you feel about it? Okay. No, I can't cover it up, and I honestly wouldn't want to. I feel like every scar holds a story. And, I mean, I'm proud of, um, you know, not what I went through, but what I made of it. And, um, you know, I've had people randomly ask me before um, in the grocery store, uh, you know, like, what happened to your neck? No manners. <laughs> And, um, and do you, just, do you, you, know, do you give them the whole to, story? Do you stand there for half an hour and give them well, the whole story? I'll, yeah, I mean, you can shock them and give them just the blunt details, <laughs> you know, or uh, kind of teach them a lesson. <laughs> or, you know, you can just be calm and share politely and still shock them a little bit. Um, but, you know, I I just think that anytime an opportunity arises, you know, that person may be the person that needs to hear my story. They may, they may need that um a little bit of hope or um, that drive. And so I I love to share, and I've always openly shared the details and um, been able to answer any questions um, that, you know, people have um, because it's something that I enjoy doing. I love hearing the feedback afterwards and, um, you know, helping other people. Now I want to finish with a, a few lighter questions. There's a lot of shows coming out of America dissecting the, the the frequent massacres which talk about unsolved or long drawn out cases even shows about SWAT teams and airport security do you watch any of these shows or or does it is it oh, hard I love, for you I love no it's not hard for me at all I love to watch true crime stories um, it's always been a favorite of mine I read true crime books and love to watch um, a lot of reality you know television shows um, that focus on crime and uh, no, it's not hard for me at all. 
And yeah, crime's something I've recently gotten into, and even on Netflix here in Australia and on another mm-hmm. platform we have called Stan, which is like a, similar to Netflix, we have different FBI shows, SWAT shows, and some of them are amazing. Like e- even the one that I saw right. you on, we had a whole season of it, and I watched all of them. And then you, you Google wow. the people afterwards, whether they're alive right. or whether they didn't survive, and you just read more about them, and you find out how, mm-hmm. how much detail they've actually gone into. Yeah, it's definitely inspiring, you know, being able to um, see other people's stories and and share your own. Is it hard for you to switch off your brain and relax? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, my brain goes 24-7. If I'm not talking about my story or worried about, I mean, I'm I'm a worrier. I worry about my kids so much. Um it's just, you know, that's just me. I always knew that uh, I would be an overprotective mother. Um, I didn't know it would be this bad, but I, uh, like I said, I try to keep it in and not rub off on my children. I don't ever want them to let my fears, you know, get in their way. So um, they are very blessed, and they're the only grandchildren on both sides of the family. So they're very spoiled, and they are very loved by so many people, I have so many amazing supporters um that have just followed my story and are so happy um you know that we were able to have babies and um that just love them so very much and i just feel so blessed um you know that they're they are you know the newest chapter of my story and i just love that i just love that this story has a happy ending and i am so glad that Dennis Bradford's not able to hurt anyone else and that, you know, I'm able to have my family with my husband and um, that our family's not complete. You know, we have our daughter, we have our son, we have a dog. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're just living life and trying to make it as normal for them as possible. But I definitely worry a lot. Um, and, you know, it's really hard for me last year to send my daughter to school for the first time. We, I'm a stay-at-home mom. We've never been away from each other. And um, it was a big step, but she loved it, and she's thriving and, um, you know, really, really awesome in school. So I love that she has those opportunities, and I love that I was able to let let go a little bit and allow her to have that opportunity and that we got through it. And she's able to go for a second year of preschool now before heading off to kindergarten next year, um, you know, to big girl school. So I'm really proud of my children and um, – you know, hope that I can continue to try to um, ease my own mind a little bit, but I just sometimes can't help it. What kind of dog do you have? Please tell me it's something a bit more bulkier than a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> a pit bull. A, a pit, oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a pit bull. Her name is Sadie, and she is 11 years old. Oh, wow. She will lick you to death. Mm. She, yeah, she's Sadie. She, uh, to me, she to me she looks more like a black lab than a pit bull. She's not like one of those big beastly <laughs> pit bulls. She's she is just uh, a loving dog. And uh, we had a boxer named Kinsey, and she passed away of cancer a few years ago. So it's just Sadie now, and um, you know, she's been a part of our family for the last eleven eleven years. So she's an old lady now. She just really <laughs> lays in her bed. And has to put up with kids all day long. So, um, before I get on to the last question, I wanted to ask about something. You just just uh, a, a couple of seconds ago, you mentioned Dennis Earl Bradford's name for the first time in this whole interview. And as an interviewer, I've got to kind of read the mood and the psychology whenever I'm doing an interview because I don't want to push too far as an interviewer. I don't want to o- overstep a line. Some interviewers will do that easily. Mm -hmm. I'm someone that I don't want to step over a line because I want, I want my interviewee to feel free to share any information they want, they want to share whatever comes out of their mouth. But you mentioned Mm -hmm. Dennis Earl Bradford's name for the first time just a minute ago. Is there a reason you haven't mentioned his name throughout the whole interview? No. No? No, I mean, I... Do you, do you try and avoid mentioning his name sometimes? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, I keep in touch with members of his family, his children, um, his parents, um, his ex-wife. 
and um, you know they've all been really great supporters of me. I don't have a problem at all saying his name or mentioning it. Um, I just think the opportunity probably arose for me to have to say <laughs> it, and so <laughs> I did. Um, yeah. But no, I um, even as a child when I was writing the notes um, in the hospital, I wrote a note that said he said his name was Dennis, which really helped. Um, you know, when we got the DNA. Uh, profile back and his name was Dennis Earl Bradford. Um, so, you know, I, no, not at all. It doesn't bother me at all. I actually had um, a picture of the side by side for the longest time in my little office area of his sketch and his driver's license picture, um, just to remind myself of how awesome <laughs> that was that I was able to, um, you know, provide such a spot on um, description of him at that age, you know, after what all I'd been through. And I finally took it down when I became a parent, um, just not wanting, you know, to have to answer any questions too soon with my daughter. Um, but no, I don't have a problem with, like, looking at his photo or mentioning his name or anything like that. It never affected me. When you meet someone okay. for the first time and they ask you to tell them something about yourself, what's the first thing you say? I'm a mom. No. <laughs> I, um, well... It would depend on the the conversation, I guess. Um, you know, if I'm meeting someone for the first time, I don't just come out and say, like, hi, I'm Jennifer, I survived an attack, <laughs> um, you know, and talk about that. Um, so I don't know. I just, I guess it would depend on who the person was and what the situation, the conversation was. Um, but, I mean, more than anything, I'm a survivor, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a friend. I um, am a daughter. I um, I try to make the best of life and what it's thrown at me. I um, you know I'm not one to hold a pity party or be angry. I just um, you know like I've said, I've always tried to make the best of any situation that's come my way, negative, positive. I try to just make if it's a positive situation, I try to just even you know make it better than what it was to begin with and if it's negative then try to take it and um, turn it into something positive and my case is um, is that something that I wanted um, to turn into a positive not only for myself and for other people and using my voice and sharing my story and being a beacon of light for others is how I can do that so um, that's what I've always tried to do okay so um, yeah you know it's empowering and I love, uh, I love to be able to do that. Let me rephrase that question a bit then. If you go on, say, Family Feud, what's the mm-hmm. funny story you're going to let Steve Harvey pick on? <laughs> oh, Lord. I don't even know. <laughs> what's going to be on your application if you go on Family Feud? <laughs> oh, good grief. <laughs> I would not even know what to say. I'm My husband's more the joker. I'm more of like the... I don't know, more literal person, I guess. So I wouldn't even know um, what to say to let him pick on me about. <laughs> no, that that's fine. You're not a game. Sh- you wouldn't go on a game show. <laughs> I probably. I mean, I would for the experience, but uh, I could not tell you right now. It's the end of a long day. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to think on that one. That's cool. So. The final question is, what do you want people to know about you or about your experience? Why have you been so open over the past almost 10 years since the case was closed? Oh, well, I mean, I've always been, I've always been open since the attack happened. It's just that I could only say so much because uh, you don't ever want to jeopardize your case. So, um, you know, as I got older and I, uh, as I got older and I was able to kind of, you know, grow into myself and uh, find who I was and um, who I wanted to be and um, all of that, and I, you know, was able to reach out to the police department on my own uh, about being involved. You know, you kind of figure out, like, what you are allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. There's things that they never release to the public, you know, for fear of jeopardizing the case and stuff. So, um I just had to be careful about what I could share. Um, but 
what we always want uh, people to take away from, especially like in our presentations or doing a TV show or sharing like this um, over the radio, is just, um, you know, to use your voice. It's that simple. Just um, every person has a story to tell. Every person has been through an experience in life um, that someone else can benefit from in hearing their story. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be crime related. Um, you know, it could be anything, any, anything that's affected a person, um, in a way where they have a story to tell, they can share that story and help other people. Uh, it's so simple, um, you know, to just openly share your story and let others benefit, um, you know, to connect with other people and hearing their story and kind of be a sounding board for one another. It's really an awesome feeling um, to know that you're not alone. And that's what I always really wanted people to know is that, you know, you're not alone. Um, there's other people out there that have been through situations similar to you, and they just may need to hear hear your story to be able to connect with you and be able to benefit from how you healed. Um, or you can benefit from hearing how they've healed. Um, just kind of, you know, be that. I, I don't like, um, I don't like sitting and thinking about how many, you know, sexual assault survivors there are out there who have never told a soul about what happened to them. That hurts me deeply. Um, you know, for people to feel afraid and um, kind of be fighting that battle in their heads. Um, it's just something that's really hard for me to even imagine just because for some reason I've been so open, been able to be so open about what happened to me. That's why I just really, really um, focus on just knowing that this is God's purpose for me in life and sharing my story. I know that that's why my voice is given back to me, um, you know, because I want to be able to help those people. And um, I think that he knew maybe I could handle it a little bit more <laughs> for some reason and so he's just given me the ability to be able to do that and try to help other people that's a great great note to finish on jennifer thank you so much for not only doing this interview with me but for actually replying to my manic messages um and oh no and i let- appreciate you and letting me actually practice my craft, do something that was a little bit outside my comfort zone from what I've used to, from what I'm used to, as I've told you, as I've told you before. And it, the hard thing for me was finding that balance between being empathetic and also trying to find a few questions that you may not have been asked before and try and make it a little bit more, I guess, for like a horrible word to use, but a bit more enjoyable for you. Um, doing this interview so thank yeah thank you for giving me so much time and it's something that it's it's gonna gonna stay with me and I've, I've watched your um episode of fbi criminal pursuits a few times just to try and let it sink in and the internet is an amazing thing because i can just go on google find out a bit more about you and then find that you have a website contact you and being someone that's in the media i get to do this so this is an actual actual proof that I can you can do anything through radio through the internet. So thank you very much for spending so much time with me today. Thank you so much for reaching out and giving me the opportunity. And you did great. <laughs> thank you. Did I ask you questions that you haven't been <laughs> asked else? before? Um, I thought the, the simplest question yeah. would have been, "Have you Googled yourself before? Have you been, like things like yeah, that?" No, yeah, I've never been asked that before.